Let's go through a little cybercrime mystery. Let's do some incident response and investigate a hack only by using logs from the environment. I want to walk you through this scenario of a hacked MSP or managed service provider that's using an Azure Active Directory. And we'll go through all these different components from the initial intrusion, pivoting in between different machines, stealing cookies and browser sessions, and then a full domain compromise. So I am inside of a Linux terminal and I have all of these logs pulled down for us. I want to be able to take a look through them. We'll open it up in an editor, but first let's get through the story. First things first, our goal is to figure out how the hack gained initial access into our domain and environment. We know this is Azure based, we're working from the cloud here, and that domain controller in the environment will track some logs for us to see what users had failed login attempts, which had attempted logins and successful logins. So let's open up that interactive login log. Now I believe this is from Microsoft Purview and I know there's a whole lot to look at here and I don't even have word wrap turned on. This is just a component, the left hand column, but we can dig into the details here. We know the date of all these entries, request ID, correlation user IDs, all of these GUIDs that uh, Microsoft Azure might track for all that information here. If I do actually toggle word wrap on, you can see these are significantly longer entries and there's more to it between what user is interacting with what service and how they're logging in. I'll zoom in on one of these entries or kind of separate it from the others so you can see, hey, here's a result, here's a record and entry that this user, Paul Bowman, did try to log in, from San Jose, California, but failed. Hey, error validating credentials due to invalid username or password, but we can even see their browser information, like the HTTP user agent header. We can see, of course, the location, and we can even see the IP address that they're coming from. The IP address information might be really valuable because we could then go analyze how many IP addresses are included in this log entry and how many times did each of them try to authenticate. If we jump back to our terminal, we can try and cat out all of the internet interactive sign-in logs, and we can actually try to cut specifying the field separator of a comma, because we know this is a CSV file or a comma separated value sheet. And I believe, oh, we need to specify that as our delimiter, but the field number, we could try to count that manually. I think it's uh, one, two, look, I think the IP address is about 20. So let's try that. Let's try F20. And let's see, will that pull all of the different IP addresses? Yes, we can see them all output on each line here. Let's try to sort that output and then let's pipe that to unique and we can display the count of how many times they're present in the file. So about 12 occurrences of this 137 IP address, 211 occurrences of 20 dot that, 121 of four, blah, blah, blah. Now that is handy information. We could go dig down and explore all of the different IP addresses and what their activity was. But I know some of you might say, oh, well, the hacker or threat actor could change their IP addresses or sort of rotate through different products proxies as they try to attack this network. And you're totally right. So there might be other malicious indicators that we could look for. We know from that example of Paul Bowman's login that they did actually try to log in with Firefox as their web browser. The HTTP user agent might be worthwhile to dig into. We see other folks using, oh, a rich client. We might see other folks using, oh, um, Python requests and more requests from Python requests. That's that automated Python module that allows us to see HTTP communication back and forth. We can force requests with that. And I'm wondering, maybe they're using a utility or a tool to try to spray a different passwords and attempt to log in through every single user. Here's Johnny Gonzalez, here's Joan King, here's Edward White. George Edwards, look at all of these failed requests. And these are all coming from that IP address, oh, what is it, 20.25. And remember, we know that 20.25, the IP address there had about 200 entries. So let's try something wild. Let's grab that 20.25 IP address, and I'm gonna search for every single line that includes that. And I want to get with regular expressions, just a dot star, everything that comes before and after it. So basically grep, right? I just want all of those lines. I'll find them all with that button down below, but I want them to be in their own separate file. And let's see how many we have here. Okay, about 
211 lines, all from the interaction of that IP address. Here, I'm gonna do a little bit of a magic trick. I'm gonna hit Control A to uh, select all of them. I'll hit Control Shift L to get multiple cursors in Sublime Text. And then I wanna cut out just all those GUIDs or some of those client details that I don't really need to know right now. Uh, but you can see, especially in the time date stamp, this is like every single second. So it's not realistic to say that, oh, every user in the organization is all trying to log in at the exact same time. This is clearly a password spray against every single user in the org. See all of their names listed and all of these failed attempts. Can I control F for failure? Let me go see here. Yep, failure, 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 failure. <laughs> Now remember, our goal is to find which user did the hacker actually break into? Which password, username, credential pairing did they find that they could successfully log in with? We wanna look for success logins, right? I'll get back to it and I'll control F for success. And we see one entry here. Uh, let me see if I could just grab that line on its own and I'll turn word wrap off here so we can dig into it. Looks like Dale Clyde's uh, one success login with multi-factor authentication but I want to add a little asterisk here, a little bit of a disclaimer, because we are kind of zoned in on just this IP address right here. Maybe uh, we're blind to something else because we've filtered strictly on this. And with that, I'm acknowledging your point, right? In that, look, the threat actor might have used multiple IP addresses. So what if, say, they brute forced passwords, found one successful login with, from one IP address, but then used another to go actually do their dirty work? Let's be cognizant about that, but these logs probably give us a little bit more detail in the error message or success message when trying to authenticate. We can see all of these login attempts with that Python request user agent, but the error message here is the user didn't enter the right credentials. We see this over and over and over again, but oh, there's something interesting on this one, I think. I'm tracking that, so let's keep note of that. Uh, okay, and there's that Dale Clyde's one down below. Is that the only oddity? Let's keep looking. No, nope. scrolling through the log, I think that's it. Uh, let me go take a look. What is the rest of that error message? Ooh. Due to a configuration change made by your administrator or because you moved to a new location, you must use multi-factor authentication to access whatever. Okay, that error message must mean that they had the correct username and password pairing. They found the right credentials, they were just prompted for multi-factor authentication. Let's get back to that line, the one where specifically there's a configuration message and they have to use multi-factor authentication. Let me remove everything just above and everything just underneath it, and it's Paul Bone. Let's turn word wrap right back on. Okay, looks like, yep, that same 20 IP address from Washington, Virginia. I'm assuming even in their password spray from that IP address, they found the correct username and password pairing. If we look back at the write-up for this lab, this exercise, and this activity, they're chatting about everything that we've been discussing, all the remote IP addresses, the uh, geographic location that they tried to sign in from, and their user agents. But look, they saw this exact same error message that we saw, the configuration change requiring multi-factor authentication, so that user, Paul Bowman's password, was discovered and then used. The next question is, did the hacker actually use this account? Were they able to success log in. Let's go back to the full log of all of these interactive sign-ins. And again, let's just look for anything for Paul Bowman. Let me try to search for everything with their username included. We'll find all copy and pastes to another entry here. And these are all the attempts, but can I look for success? Oh, yep. Looks like there are plenty of success entries for our Paul user here. Do we have the timestamp from the misconfiguration error log that tells us kind of when this all happened here? Oh, I think I cut that part out uh, while we were editing. That's all right. We can go back to it and search for that configuration change. Yeah, okay, so that was uh, 1703 Zulu. Let's look back at these logs of the other entries. We have a 1703 that is a success. Yeah, it looks like that 1703 timestamp is here and then everything following is just a bit after later in the minute. We can look for those success entries as they did log in. And again, yep, this looks like a different IP address. So I think our hunch was right. Now we have our first breadcrumb. We have our first puzzle piece, we know that the user Paul Bowman was compromised. The threat actor used that as their initial access and now a springboard and launching point to move further into the network. So let's go see what else they did. 
Oh, and hey, before we get too far down the rabbit hole, please let me say this whole activity, this exercise, this lab environment is all from John Strand and anti-siphon training and Black Hills Information Security and that whole tribe of companies doing incredible stuff and especially from their pay what you can training. I'm not sure if you're already spun up on all these stuff that they offer, but there is seriously so much good stuff between learning how to be a security operations center specialist, doing some penetration testing, digging into other training and education. It's all phenomenal. And look, if you dig into their pay what you can training, you can literally choose the price tag for all the awesome stuff here. You decide how much you want to pay. If you love some live and online training, you can check out some of the courses that they have coming up on the calendar. I see some stuff open in November, plenty more on the horizon. Take a look at the roadmap, see what's coming up on the schedule and take a look at some of John Strand's other intro labs. We've done some videos on them, but they have some phenomenal stuff here to work with other digital forensics, incident response, live hacking, etc. If you want to take a look at the navigation, here, we can pull down and see all of the great labs and activities and exercises that they showcase. All the stuff from introduction to security, even some active defense and cyber deception, plenty of awesome stuff to dig into for real cybersecurity training. Huge thanks to Andy Siphon Training, Black Hills InfoSec, and John Strand and that whole crew for sponsoring this video. Please, please, please go take a look. Pay what you can training, link below in the video description. After the discovery of the compromised user Paul Bowman, we decided to go through the security logs of each workstation and look for any suspicious files being run or used by other users. This is, of course, pivoting. So we have some new logs to look through and let's go dig into those. I've opened up this other .csv file and this looks like an export of the security log from the Windows Event Viewer. So with that, we can see all the stuff that happened on that endpoint, presumably Workstation 3 or WS3. So we can see files that ran, hey, programs, applications. And let me actually dig into that. We can see, oh, process ID, or process names, let me go search for every single process name to see just are there any oddball things that stick out. Let's get back to the command line and let's try to actually use that cat and grep capability one more time. Let's grep for process name, display all those, and now we could actually kind of cut this, right, if we wanted to. Let's cut with a delimiter of a colon and get the, I uh, think, third field, right? There we go. So now we have all of the executables ran. Let's pipe that to another sort and unique tag. See, just for some poor man's analytics here, let's see, are there any oddities? This is the path to an executable ran on this host and the number of times that that was executed. So let's see, is there anything that sticks out? I'll keep scrolling, I'll keep scrolling. I am most interested in things that probably only ran once because you really only need one invocation of malware, right? But there are a couple other interesting things. Uh, I see Ninja RMM in here, a remote monitoring and management solution. Uh, some regular Windows tooling, right? WMI things are happening. Oh, Cyber CNS is in here just as well. But I got to admit, I don't see anything that sticks out right at first bat. But don't forget, let's take another big picture view. We might have pigeonholed ourselves just by looking for things that have semicolons in the path. Because we're using that cut command and using the semicolon as the delimiter looking at the second field, we might be just trimming stuff out of our view. Let's go back to the command that we ran, but let's remove the cut and just kind of see, hey, give me everything. I'm fine with it. Um, now we see some weird stuff, right? Hey, two occurrences of a process name being executed from a device. Another device looks like WS or Workstation 1, file 5, maybe that's a file share. Super specialized, highly advanced malware bypasser 2.exe. Okay, a little on the nose, a little cheeky, but that's probably bad. Now, this means something interesting because we saw these logs these, uh, again, Windows event viewer logs of the security tab, that security log from the workstation number three. But it looks like it pulled a file from workstation number one. And that was where Paul Bowman had actually logged in, given his use. Now we've seen initial access and we've seen lateral movement. They were pivoting from machine to machine. But there was something interesting that we caught in just a moment of looking at the processes invoked, Ninja RMM. There's a remote monitoring and management tool in use in this management service provider environment. So this threat actor, this hacker could do something a little bit dangerous. They could dig into another user's cookies or their session information, right? Hey, maybe they were able to get into an endpoint, one of the workstations like workstation three, workstation, whatever, and maybe they could actually invoke this malware or they could actually dig into some other information. Maybe their malware would be like an information stealer or a cookie stealer that would retrieve all the sensitive details and all the cache data of their web browsers. Because hey, 
say you're a system administrator, you're one of the IT engineers that works with the remote monitoring and management tool, well, you probably interact with that in your web browser, like Google Chrome, right? But before we go too far down the rabbit hole here, let's keep in mind, okay, that we just saw this super specialized, highly advanced malware bypass or whatever on this workstation number three. And that was actually invoked as this other user, Henry Dot Butler. Um, okay, well now let's kind of explore some other logs that are provided here to see, did they genuinely steal cookies to access the RMM capability? Yeah, okay, looks like Henry Butler uh, was working with, oh, <laughs> Their super specialized, highly advanced malware bypasser did in fact try to access another object or another file that would steal cookies from Google Chrome. This is bad news bears. And it's coming from the audit log on this host, right? Okay, object ID number from the audit log 4663. Looks like an object was being accessed and hey, the malware reached out to try and steal cookies. We see this in the log entry and they showcase it in the lab. Now you might be thinking, so what? The remote monitoring and management tool, Ninja RMM or whatever case might be, that probably has multi-factor authentication configured, right? That's enabled, that's enforced, so that way you wouldn't be able to get into the RMM without the end user, really without the IT administrator allowing and granting that to authenticate. However, our threat actor under the compromised Paul Bowman user was able to steal these credentials from Henry Butler. And they weren't just credentials though, they were cookies, they were session, cookies, and browser details. So that, hey, that user Henry, sure, maybe they would manage the RMM utility, but those cookies allow for access without logging in because it's for the session. They don't need a multi-factor authentication because they've already gained everything. That is session hijacking, right? They could just slap it into their own web browser, use a cookie modifying extension, or even just go in like the developer tools and then put in everything they have. Now here's the final question. Say our threat actor, they've gained their initial access, they've done their lateral movement, they've dropped some malware for that cookie stealing and information grabbing, but what will they do with the remote monitoring and management access? With the capability of that tool, what will they do? Well, they didn't just compromise one machine, but they have compromised the entire domain. Because RMMs, that utility, can manage every single workstation and endpoint, it can push down other software, other patches, other tooling, and do whatever they want. It's super user access, right? It's the queen bee or the mothership. We can take a look at the logs here. And again, this is the RMM. This is the remote monitoring and management tool. And we see a couple actions completed. Oh, running some system applications. Oh, our super specialized, highly advanced malware is ran on all. Uh, all of the endpoints, all of the hosts, all the workstations, every server, anything under management of that utility, looks like they did blast their malware out. That was probably used to steal more information from other users. Hey, can we access everyone else in the organization, all the employees of the business? But you can see finally one of the other last lines of the RMM. It looks like it did also push out another binary custom2.exe on all hosts. And that could very well be the RAT, the Remote Access Trojan or Toolkit, maybe some Cobalt Strike, maybe some Command and Control, whatever. The damage is already done. We can read here that the attack hacker has pushed out malware on every single host, including the domain controller. It's safe to assume every single machine is now compromised, and this turned into that doomsday nightmare scenario where the RMM has been breached and can now push out ransomware, cryptocurrency miners, I don't know, defacing utilities, whatever, on all the hosts. The small breach has become a nightmare disaster and we'll need that instant response. With that, we followed this intrusion from cradle to grave. We saw the initial access by the threat actor, their lateral movement and their escalation, and then what they might do from now on. Sounds like we need to get that Paul Bowman user some security awareness training and uh, maybe a password manager in place. Make sure we can have some stronger credentials that don't lead to a full-blown compromise. Again, this is all free education from John Strand and Black Hills Information Security and Anti-Siphon Training and that whole tribe of companies and their pay what you can, exercises, material, courses, labs, and great curriculum. Please, please, please check them out. Link in the video description. Seriously, you can decide the price tag and it's extremely valuable for you, your team, your organization organization and the whole industry for making the place better, making the whole world better by all getting sharper on cybersecurity. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you in the next one.